Hello, my fellow weirdlings, it's Margot, and today I'm talking about the time that somebody stole Albert Einstein's brain. So if you're ready for some strange history, keep watching. As you probably know, Albert Einstein is widely acknowledged as one of the greatest and most influential physicists of all time. A theoretical physicist, Einstein was best known for developing the theory of relativity, though he also made important contributions to the development of the theory of quantum mechanics. He was born in Germany on March 14, 1879, and died in 1955. Though it's not his remarkable life that we'll be discussing here today, but rather the unusual series of events that took place after his death. In order to make this make the tiniest bit of sense, I should mention that in the early to mid 19th century, it was relatively common practice to preserve the brains of geniuses and extraordinary thinkers so they could be studied in the hopes of determining the origins of their unusual intelligence. Fun fact, Walt Whitman's brain, at his request, had been preserved for study, but was accidentally dropped on the floor and subsequently discarded by a lab assistant. Many experts are adamant that Einstein explicitly forbade the performance of such studies on his brain, realizing they rarely produced useful information. Others assert that he actually did show an interest in brain preservation and study, because many years before his death, an x-ray of his skull was taken along with an electroencephalography, or EEG, which detects abnormalities in brain waves or in the electrical activity of the brain using electrodes. In either case, there's no written evidence that Einstein wanted his brain used for scientific purposes upon his death. It's been said that Einstein wasn't fond of seeing medical doctors during his lifetime, at least not when it came to his personal health. Maybe he should have avoided them in death as well. But several years before he died, Einstein had to undergo an exploratory laparotomy to find the cause of severe abdominal pains. It was found that he had a grapefruit-sized abdominal aortic aneurysm. An aneurysm is a ballooning and weakened area in an artery. A ruptured aneurysm can result in internal bleeding, stroke, and can sometimes be fatal. The aorta is the large artery that carries blood from the heart through the chest and torso. It's the body's main supplier of blood, so it's pretty important. At that time, treatment options were limited. Einstein's physicians opted to wrap the aneurysm with a cellophane-like material. The patch held for the next five years. Then, on April 13, 1955, the aneurysm began to leak, and doctors were sure it was about to rupture. With treatment options still very limited, Einstein opted to refuse further treatment. Albert Einstein died five days later of a burst aorta in the early morning of April 18, 1955, at what's now known as the Penn Medicine Princeton Medical Center in Plainsboro Township, New Jersey. He was 76 years old. Einstein was a very private man, albeit a public figure. He requested that he be cremated, and his ashes scattered in a private location, which ended up taking place along the Delaware River, in order to discourage idolaters. The fact that he didn't leave instructions for his brain to be preserved and used for scientific study, while being so specific about his wishes otherwise, leads me to believe his brain becoming a public spectacle probably wasn't what he wanted. Nonetheless, without permission from Einstein's son, Hans Albert, who was his next of kin, Einstein's brain and eyes were secretly removed by pathologist Dr. Thomas Stoltz Harvey during his autopsy, and weren't cremated with the rest of his physical remains. At the time, Harvey claimed the hospital was given permission to do an autopsy, and said, I knew we had permission to do an autopsy, and I assumed that we were going to study the brain. Harvey always asserted that Dr. Otto Nathan, the executor of Einstein's will, was also present during the autopsy. Dr. Nathan eventually admitted to being there, but claimed to have no idea what Harvey was doing as his view was obstructed. Decades later, Einstein's granddaughter, Evelyn Einstein, stated that the family never trusted Nathan and believed he was up to no good. So it does seem possible that the executor of Einstein's will did secretly give permission to remove the brain. The rest of Einstein's body was cremated in Trenton, New Jersey on April 20, 1955. When Hans Albert and the rest of Einstein's family discovered what Dr. Harvey had done, they were initially furious, but they eventually agreed to allow Harvey to conduct his research. 
This was under the one stipulation that none of the findings from this research be subject to sensationalism. Einstein's family were assured that Harvey's findings would only be published in reputable scientific journals. Ultimately, these promises would not be kept. Possessing perhaps the most renowned intellect of his time, the theft and study of Einstein's brain couldn't help but garner sensationalized media attention. Like the researchers who'd previously studied other geniuses' brains, Harvey's motive for essentially stealing Einstein's brain was to identify whether the renowned physicist genius was caused by physical or structural differences within it. But according to author Carolyn Abraham, Harvey also, quote, had some big professional hopes pinned on that brain, suggesting that Harvey felt possessing Einstein's brain would further his career in medicine. If that was his hope, he'd soon find himself sorely disappointed, but we'll get into that in a minute. Abraham also stated of brain collecting in the 1950s, they felt that having the brain would put them on a par with the Russians who were collecting their own brains at the time. People were collecting brains. It was a thing. Before we dive into the dissection of Einstein's brain, you may be wondering what happened to his eyes. They were given to Einstein's ophthalmologist, Dr. Henry Abrams, for what purpose, I do not know. They've never been recovered, though there are persistent rumors that they're stored in a safe deposit box somewhere in New York City. But Einstein's brain kind of ended up everywhere. I'll try not to go too deep into the scientific process here, though if you're like me and into things like taxidermy and wet specimens, you'll probably find it interesting. Dr. Harvey immediately took Einstein's brain home and began the preservation process. The brain required a few days to harden. Harvey noted that the brain weighed 1,230 grams, which was reportedly lighter than the average for men of Einstein's age. He meticulously took photographs and diagrams of the brain, then sectioned it into 21 parts, which he also photographed and even commissioned a painting of. The commissioning of the painting has led some people to wonder if he hadn't become a little bit obsessed with the organ. The specimen was divided into 240 celloidin blocks and stored in mason jars. It was unfortunately stored at room temperature, which made it impossible to later collect DNA. The genetic discovery of DNA was just two years old in the scientific community at that time. Later, pieces of Einstein's brain were further cut into 12 sets of microscopic slides at the University of Pennsylvania for additional study. The one part of the brain not dissected was the cerebellum, which is located at the back of the head behind the brain stem and controls balance and other complex motor functions. The pathology laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania was one of the few places in 1955 that had the technical ability to carefully prepare thinly cut sections of brain. Many researchers are disappointed that Harvey cut up the brain before it could be studied in its entirety, but Harvey had been trained at Yale, where it was believed that the answer to finding the source of intellect was by studying the microscopic anatomy and not the intact brain. It is worth noting that Harvey wasn't a neurosurgeon nor a brain specialist. By the end of 1955, Harvey possessed several hundred microscopic slides and undissected pieces of brain in formalin jars, along with dozens of photos and sketches of the brain. He insisted his interest in the brain was purely scientific, stating he'd intended to have a group of distinguished neuroanatomists study it, then write a paper. He drove the brain across the country, delivering pieces to curious researchers and friends. He even gave samples to the U.S. Army. Harvey petitioned many noted scientists to review the material gleaned from studying Einstein's brain, but unfortunately there was a growing notoriety within the scientific community and public opinion over the handling of the brain. In fact, newspaper headlines at the time declared that two hospitals were in a public tiff over who would get to do the initial studies of the brain, between Princeton Hospital in New Jersey and Harvey's mentor in New York, who he'd promised first crack at it. It was a media circus. Harvey was soon fired from Princeton Hospital and took the brain with him. It's widely assumed his termination was caused by his newfound negative notoriety, though it's also been mentioned that there were many rumors and much speculation around his personal life at the time. At that point, Harvey hit some really hard times. Along with losing his job, he also lost his medical license and his marriage. 
After losing his job at Princeton, Harvey stored Einstein's brain in his basement office until his then-wife reportedly threatened to throw it out. It's unclear whether this had anything to do with their divorce. Maybe I should have titled this The Curse of Einstein's Stolen Brain. Harvey then moved to the Midwest where he frequently relocated for years as he dealt with his divorce, licensure issues, and trying to find a stable job. He continued to send samples of Einstein's brain to researchers. He eventually took a position as a supervisor in a biologic testing lab in Wichita, Kansas. At his new home, Harvey stashed what remained of Einstein's brain in a cider box under a beer cooler, where it pretty much remained for the next several decades. The fate of Einstein's stolen brain was pretty much unknown until 1978, when a reporter for New Jersey Monthly Magazine named Stephen Levy tracked Harvey down in Wichita and was shocked by the brain storage location. The resulting magazine article brought in a flood of newfound interest in and requests for samples of the brain. Samples were sent to a new generation of scientists with far more advancements in scientific research. In 1985, 30 years after Einstein's death, scientists finally began to publish their findings, all of which have seemingly been controversial from then until today. Many of these studies did claim to find some differences between Einstein's brain and a so-called normal brain. Published in Experimental Neurology in 1985, the first findings on Einstein's brain by Marion Diamond of UCLA revealed that it had an above-average amount of glial cells, which keep the neurons in the brain oxygenated and engaged. A later study from the University of Alabama at Birmingham in 1996 added that these neurons were also more tightly packed than usual, and thus possibly conducive to faster processing of information. In 1999, a study of Harvey's photos of the brain published in The Lancet noted that Einstein's inferior parietal lobe was 15% wider than average, with an abnormal folding pattern which may have made him a more visual thinker than most. These areas also correlate with mathematical ability. A more recent study in 2012 claimed that Einstein's brain had an extra ridge in its midfrontal lobe, an area associated with plan making and memory. More findings were published in 1998 by Dr. Frederick Lepore in his book titled Finding Einstein's Brain. Lepore, a neurologist, had worked on the 2012 study. He examined photos and microscopic sections of Einstein's brain and concluded that it had an extraordinary cortical structure. He reported that the prefrontal cortex was highly developed, which could correlate with Einstein's extraordinary cognitive abilities. He also noted that the primary somatosensory and motor cortices near the region representing the tongue and face were greatly expanded in the left hemisphere, and as the 1999 study showed, that the parietal lobes were unusual and may have contributed to Einstein's unique visuospatial and mathematical skills. Of the five published studies, none really proved whether the physical structures of the brain actually affect a person's intelligence. All of these studies lacked representative control groups, so anything they found is really just conjecture and the results are considered inconclusive. Harvey himself never published a scientific paper of any relevance. Pace University psychologist Terence Hines has referred to assumptions generated from these studies as a kind of neuromythology. He's emphatic that, quote, you can't just take one brain of someone who is different from everyone else, and we pretty much all are, and say, aha, I found the thing that makes T. Hines a stamp collector, end quote. Researcher Dr. Lepore himself said, I don't know if Einstein was a genius, because his parietal lobes were different. If you put my feet to the fire and you say, where's special relativity? Where did general relativity come from? We have no idea. In 1988, Harvey had his medical license revoked again after failing a three-day competency exam in Missouri. A few years later, he returned to Princeton Hospital. From there, 84-year-old Harvey was convinced by journalist Michael Paterniti to embark on a cross-country road trip to meet Einstein's granddaughter Evelyn Einstein in Berkeley, California. Paterniti's book, Driving Mr. Albert, documented their road trip with jars of Einstein's brain in a duffel bag in the trunk of Harvey's Buick Skylark. After their visit with Evelyn, Harvey forgot the brain at her house. She returned it to him, wanting nothing to do with it. That's a pretty good example of how careless Harvey seems to have been with the care of Einstein's brain over the decades. 
Thomas Harvey died in April of 2007 at the age of 94 in the same hospital where he'd stolen Albert Einstein's brain 39 years earlier. Before his death, he donated what remained of Einstein's brain to Princeton Hospital. Many of the researchers who'd received samples of the brain over the decades also returned them to Princeton Hospital and the University of Pennsylvania where they were originally cut. Almost nobody is allowed to see these specimens, not even researchers. The one place where the public can currently see pieces of Einstein's brain, along with handwritten notes from Thomas Harvey, is at the Muda Museum in Philadelphia. But thanks to Harvey's habit of giving pieces of Einstein's brain away to pretty much anybody who asked for some, you can possibly find bits of Einstein here and there in beer coolers all across America. Many people today question Thomas Harvey's ethics, and rightly so. I can't imagine the theft of human body parts has ever been fully approved of. But the moral and ethical questions surrounding this topic have evolved over time. It seems the trafficking of human organs wasn't quite as frowned upon in 1955 as it is today. At that time, it seems that people weren't as offended by the theft of Einstein's brain as they were the handling, preservation, and distribution of it. What I still really want to know is, where the heck are Einstein's eyes? That's all I have for you today. I hope you've enjoyed this story and will come back for more. Like, subscribe, leave a comment, and bring your friends, family, COVID pod, cult members, invisible friends, or enemies. And if you have an opinion on any of this, leave them in the comments below. Thanks so much for watching.